All right, welcome everyone to Track Talk, and I'm very excited to welcome my guest today, truly a legendary bassist, uh, musician. Please welcome to Track Talk, Stanley Sheldon. Hey, hey Stanley. Everybody. All right. Thank you for being here today, my friend. I should thank you for having yeah. me. My pleasure, my pleasure. And I, and I should say here in the intro that if people don't know already, we'll be talking about the iconic song, Do You Feel Like We Do by Peter Frampton. And Peter, as you know, I'm sure, just celebrated his birthday. That's right. Yep. We're the same age. We were both born in 1950. It's really easy to do the math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those, uh, yeah, I was born in 60, so it's exactly 10, the, the, uh, same Decent. deal same yeah, deal same deal uh thank you for being here today stanley it's 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 such a an honor to have you thank you yeah man thank you i i have to tell you when when we met um four i was thinking four years ago now in nashville at rick's master class that long? That? yeah at drum paradise i know and you guys were just starting to work on getting the ronin band back together rehearsing there in nashville I was, you know, I really wanted to like, I had to really keep it together to not want to just pick your brain on all the things we're going to talk about today and more just, you know, knowing your history and, 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 and but anyway, yeah, it's, it's great to be able to sit here and talk about this, like, like we're going to do. Well, yeah, it's, it's fun to do these. I love doing them. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm going to just share this photo from, from that day. I think, I think you were maybe caught off guard when they took the photo, but <laughs> look a little bit like the deer in the headlights a little bit yeah. <laughs> but yeah there's wadi and harry mccarthy myself rick Morata, uh dan doug moore yeah dan doug moore yourself who's the guy and, on my shoulder who is that that is steve gorman uh the drummer the original drummer for the black crows oh wow yeah yeah i didn't realize he was there he came and met me there. He and I went off and had lunch together. So he kind of, that was our meeting spot and Good drummer. Uh, great drummer. Yeah. I had him jump in the photo and yeah. Great drummer. Great guy. Well, I want to jump in. I want to, I want to talk about this song and I know, I know this song has been probably dissected a million times. You mentioned Peter had done it himself not too long ago. And, um, you know, I thought we'd take a little different angle on this too. I wanted to play, if we could jump in for a second, um, the studio, the original studio version from 1973. With Rick with, Wills on bass. Yeah. Rick Wills on bass, yeah. And um, is it Mick Gallagher that was playing keyboards on this version? Right, right. And I, I had never met Mick, but he, he was Peter's keyboard player at the time. Yeah. And, you know, I realized too, I, I'm sure you knew this, I, I never realized that, that all four band members at that time all got writing credits on this song john siomos rick mick and of course peter um, right because it, it, if you listen to the song it's got like all these little sections so i think rick wills wrote he wrote the part where it's the long extended you know just that three chord thing that yeah. may have been what rick contributed i'm not sure i'd have to ask him <laughs> okay yeah well you know I, before i started I, I, a couple of observations and and you know obviously correct me if I'm way off base, but what I, what I found just from, from this version, and, and I think I'm betting a lot of people maybe ne have never heard this version of it, the, the studio version, because I've probably heard it like three times before today in my life. You know, it's the, it's the version you're on, the live version that everybody's so familiar with. But uh, what I found about, interesting about this is it's, it's, a, it's slower, of course. It's the, you know, the original tempo. I, I clocked it around 96 BPM. Um, but it's kind of busier. It's everybody's, it's almost got like a prog vibe to it and I'll, I'll play it. Yeah. I and, haven't heard it probably since I learned that, you know, Peter gave me the three studio albums when I met him for the audition. He goes, okay, you've got two weeks. Here's the, the three albums. And yeah, let's hear it. Okay. I haven't heard it for a while. I'll, I'll play a little of it and then, then we'll come back and talk about the audition too, which, which would be great. Great segue into the live version. So yeah, let's, um, Let's hear it. Mm -hmm. 
John's playing like 16th notes in the hi-hat. It's a lot slower than, than our A version. lot slower, yeah. Here's the modulation. Mm. Nick's going for it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Busy right here, musically, I think, anyway. Sounds great, but it's, it's less groovy than it's interesting, and I'll I'll, I'll get what my opinion is anyway. Yeah, it's it's interesting hearing this. I'm gonna just I'm gonna bring it to this point at um, about four minutes. When you guys get into the instrumental part you were talking about, the um, four minutes, 20 seconds, I think. That is so much slower. I didn't realize it was that much slower. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel like I do? Do you feel? Do you feel? Does he do a talk box on you? Like you know, I don't think so. Sounds like the zombies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this version is six minutes forty-five seconds, and um, I think it's just just guitar solo. Yeah. No, it does, it's the ending you guys did as well. Same ending? Yeah. Not quite as extended or as exaggerated, but you'll hear it. I guess you could say it's, it's abbreviated. Yeah, so I, I think that's that's we'll have something to now as a sort of basis to compare the live version and, and uh, um, it's that's interesting a good reference. You yeah, know, I don't. Sorry to interrupt, but I'm thinking no, okay. when I listened to Rick Wills and the parts I was 
emulating, you know, when I auditioned, uh, you know, Rick and I, I think we both listened to James Jamerson a lot, you know, because he was trying to do a lot of those kind of movements on the bass. And that's, that's where I, I was taking it as well. So Rick, he laid down a really good roadmap for me. And I think everybody did. The keyboards seem a little busy through the song, like you said, especially in the beginning. It's kind of like, hey, what's yeah. going on? <laughs> There's a lot going on here. But uh, I don't know. It's it's interesting to compare the two versions. Yeah, and I, I was going to ask you before we, we play the next version. First, I, I, I want to get the story on how you auditioned and, and got the job. And um, But I, I've heard from, you know, I know a lot of, great drummers that have played with Peter through the years, Joe Vitale. Uh, Gosh, it was, uh, it was heaven for me. I got to meet 10 of the greatest drummers in the world in about oh, two years, yeah. in a two year period. There were that many. Okay. I, Cause I, it, Joe comes to mind, Joe Vitale, Rick Murata, of course. Um, well, it was interesting. You know, the first two were the, both of Sly's original drummers uh, were the first two that came in when John was having his, his hit problems. And it was uh, first Gregorico. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh my and, gosh. And about a week later it was Andy Newmark. You know, Peter Peter was really asking these guys to play John's parts and some some of them you know were more or less uh inclined to do so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Like a like a true diplomat. Yeah. <laughs> well, then it right I'll, I'll make this quick just to enumerate the drummers. After yeah. after Andy, it was I think it was Rick next. And then uh, Joe Vitale, I brought Joe Vitale in because I had known him back in Colorado. He lasted the longest, probably yeah. of anybody. Jamie Oldacre came in right after that. Right. And then uh, Gary Malabar was there right after Jamie or right in between about the same time. And uh, well, that's six or seven right there. Yeah, those are incredible still, drummers. The greatest drummers of that period and, and, and of all time, you know, I mean, Wow. Holy shit. I didn't realize, it, I, I didn't know Gary played with him. Wow. Yeah. Gary was there briefly, you know, Peter was, he was really tough on drummers. Joe Vitale and I joke about it. He's Peter's is hard on drummers. Like Steve stills is hard on bass players. <laughs> <laughs> Even went through every great bass player, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, willy yeah. nilly. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Well, you know, and, and I'd always, I'd, I've, I, the drummers that I've known that work with Peter absolutely love and respect him, but have said that he's really particular about tempo, that he's really pretty finite about like where he wants yeah. a song to, to sit and feel. Um, so it just, I guess my, my point to that is that it's interesting, interesting that this song is so much, the live version is so much faster. And I, I'm guessing he had, Peter must've made some sort of conscious decision that he wanted it more up tempo, more, you know, kind of. I learned I learned a lot from Peter about, you know, I like to count in songs sometimes if 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 uh, if it's deferred to me to to count songs in, I like to do it. Uh, but I, I watched Peter, you know, he had a really. Uh, it was a observable trait where he would he would pause for a second, you'd see him just think of the song and get, you know, the tempo in his head. This was on stage, you know, I, yeah. I can see his wheels turning on stage. And he would he would get that tempo, and then he'd have it. So, I think when we rehearsed, after I when I auditioned the tempo, he was counting it faster. I think you know, thinking, hey, it's kind of like the old Motown reviews, you know, live it was always so much faster. Yes, yeah. But with Do You Feel, I think it needed to come up in tempo a little bit. Absolutely, but, and I, I it's funny you say that, Stanley. I made a note that. Um, you know, I feel like all those records, like you say, the the 70s, you know, there were so many great live records made in the 70s. It was kind of like that decade of you'd take a, you know, a band would go out and, you know, they they tour and they'd always come back with a live record of all their hit songs, basically. Um, and, you know, it, it continued on, but and they'd always be fast. I remember Charlie Watts saying this, that like talking about the Stone songs, how today they play them much closer to the original tempos than they did in the 70s they just played everything faster and it could have been other reasons why the stones played them faster but um but that was kind that, of a thing yeah well peter's he, he is he is a real tempo master and he uh 
he puts it where he wants it, you know, and it varies from night to night. Yeah. But he's yeah. usually pretty close to where he's uh, decided it should be. Yeah. How did, so how did you, how did you audition? How did the audition come about? And um... that's a good story. You know, I was, I had just moved to LA from Boulder, Colorado, where in Boulder in 1972 or three or four, right before we moved, Tommy Bolin and I were playing in a fusion band and, and, you know, we couldn't get arrested. We were playing, it was really fun, you know, but yeah. I come from that fusion background uh, playing with Tommy and we got to back up a lot of the blues greats like John Lee Hooker and Albert King. And uh, someone posted yesterday on face, Facebook, Tommy and I backing up big mama Thornton on hound dog. Oh my at gosh! A, at a club in Denver, you got to hear it because it's really cool, I think. And I, it's it just surfaced. I'd never heard it before, so I was thrilled that that was there. But so we were in Boulder, and Kenny Passarelli was also there. You know, we were all he was from Denver, and I had met Kenny because he was playing with Tommy before he joined Barnstorm and Joe Walsh. Yeah. Tommy basically said, "Here, Kenny, go play with Walsh, and I'll find another bass player." You know, so that was me. <laughs> <laughs> so Tommy, Tommy and I became the best of friends and Kenny and I remained friends. Well, later on, a couple of years later, Kenny was so in demand. He had just played with Stills and Walsh, Dan Fogelberg and Elton called him. Elton John called Kenny about the same time Peter was looking for a bass player. And Kenny had called or Peter had called Kenny and asked him if he would uh, join the Frampton band. And Kenny said, I can't. I'm, I'm going leaving to play with Elton but you should try this guy, Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I was, I was in LA and I, I'll never forget it. Cause Peter was staying at the Beverly Wilshire really nice hotel. It's oh yeah. Swanky place. And I was thinking, Hey, that's a good address. This looks good. So I, I called him back then. I just somehow got his number. You know, you couldn't do that today. Kenny gave it to me, I guess. So I called Peter and he goes, yes, come on over come to Beverly Wilshire, uh, bring your bass. So I brought an amp. I pushed, I had a vibro verb heavier than hell, this Fender amp. I, it was on rollers, but I, I remember rolling it up the sidewalk at Beverly Wilshire, <laughs> right, right up right up to the elevator and did my audition. And uh, I, I knocked on the door on whatever floor it was. Oh my God. Up, up high. And Peter, Penny answered, Peter's girlfriend. And it was like... When Peter came to the door and I looked in his eyes, it was just, I don't know. You know, you can look back and, and, and put more meaning to things that happened or not. But somehow I felt like, yeah, this is probably going to work. I just it felt right yep. without even playing, you know, just meet him. And uh, I mean, we were both born in 1950, you know, so we had a lot in common musically already. Yeah. Yep. And when we looked in each other's eyes, you know, it's just kind of, hey, hope this works. I think that's already. Yeah, I think that's huge, Stanley. Not to interrupt you, but I, I totally agree with what you're saying. Like, you're you're born the same year. You're from the same generation. Obviously, listening to I'm sure many, if not all, of the same people and influences, and that's that's huge right there. Yeah. Yeah. Peter was a huge fan of Motown, you know. So my style, which is it's kind of based on you know that R and B Jamerson thing, like a lot of bass players were. You know, you, you hear uh, John Paul Jones doing it. You hear every everybody was trying to do Jamerson. Yeah, and as was I, I still do. That's still my go to. Like, what would Jamerson do? You know. Yeah. So Peter and I were listening to a lot of the same stuff at that point in time. He was. We were all listening to nothing but Stevie Wonder. I would say those. You know, music of my mind had come out. Of course, we were listening to other stuff, but primarily it was Stevie. You know, Peter was covering Steve. He's always covered Stevie Wonder mm -hmm. tips. He did. Uh, Signs I, be Deliver. I believe when we fall in love is on one of those solo albums. Yeah. And he does yeah. a credible version of it. But Peter adored uh, Stevie. That's where he got the idea for the talk box. Frampton's wow. Camel. You yeah. know, get on, get on your camel and ride. Remember Stevie? I that, uh it's the music of my mind albums. The okay. first time Stevie did the talk box. So wow. Peter was just enamored with that. And that's how that came about. But, you know, you can go back to Nashville. And some of the old uh, pedal steel players made their guitars talk like that. Right. Right. Wow. 
that's some that's some great history and and basically you, you played a little bit for him and and that was it he said we played three songs uh he wanted a fretless bass player <laughs> you know kenny kenny passarelli i mean it's interesting there weren't many of, that many of us playing fretless bass back then in a rock format danko was the first one i saw using it and i immediately gravitated to it man i want to do that i like that sound and luckily i had the ear for it i could make the note be in tune kind of important and uh Kenny was the other one. Kenny Passarelli was playing fretless bass on Rocky Mountain Way. And uh, I think Kenny and Dee Murray, Elton's bass player, played yeah. fretless. Wow. Great bass player. Great bass so, player. So, but there weren't a lot of us. That was, that's about it. Yeah. So Peter wanted a fretless bass player. So I brought my fretless. And I remember we played uh, in the Baby, I Love Your Way. And then Money, which has it. Wow. Wow, it's got a slide that's just ready made for the fretless bass. So wow. he was listening to make sure I was in tune. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so right after that, it was like we, it, it couldn't have lasted more than 20 minutes, my audition. And he goes, okay, I've got to go into the dentist next month for some surgery, oral surgery. And here's the three albums. Good luck. Uh, you'll have a plane ticket to, to, to New York round trip and uh, we'll see if John how, how you get on with John you know because that was the bottom line yeah and then when I got to New York when I walked into SIR John was the first one I saw he was he was just him in there playing those that green kit that became famous yeah man and I just stood there and listened to this this incredible feel that John had just playing alone. And it was really, this was at SIR on 57th Street, wherever that was, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. Uh, but it was just me and John for the first few minutes and then Bobby showed up and then Peter and we played the songs. And I think we played two songs. I was nervous as hell. And after two songs, Peter goes, welcome to the band, you know? Wow. So it was Man. it was pretty exciting for a young kid. And, and like, it, yeah. it felt, it felt really great with John instantly for you. you, you felt we like clicked a, a so well. Yeah. Because John came from that same, he loved Motown too. He grew up in Chicago on the South Side. So he was funky as hell. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> he played with Mitch Ryder. Did you know that? I didn't know that. No, I didn't realize that. Yeah, he had been playing with Mitch Ryder. I guess that famous drummer that Mitch's first drummer somehow wasn't there for a while. But John came in and, and did that. I think he's what really turned turned uh, Peter into such a fan of John was when he heard "Hello, It's Me" because that's Siomas on on that track, Todd Rundgren's track. Yes, that, yep. And that's a really cool track to listen to because John's feel is just it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Did I, I, I know. The yeah, you did. Yeah, when I when I, I that that song "Hello, It's Me" Todd Rundgren track is just uh, I knew you know I think we've talked about that you and I too and. Um, that's an incredible showcase of John Siomos's feel and his time and his just everything is dynamic. You know, he could play so dynamically too. Just that soft. Uh, he had an incredible touch. Yeah. Yeah. That, amazing. His symbol work. And then remember that those three the bars of three. And I never yeah. Oh man. That yeah. That three four for like six bars. Yeah. So cool. But oh, John, he nailed that track, and that's what that's what caught Peter's ears when yeah. he hired him. And and so when you came in, you you come to, you came to SIR, um, and I think it was I think Fifty Second Street is where that I, I know right. that location. Yeah, um, Bobby Mayo was was in the band at that time. Was he a new member as well, or somewhat new? He or was he somewhat had, new. Somewhat he new. had been hired. He hadn't toured with Peter yet, or. Maybe I'm mistaken there. He may have done one short tour, uh, but he was the last one to come in before me. Yeah. So yeah. John had been with Peter for a long time and Bobby very briefly. Yeah. Yeah. So Bobby, you know, we were all from the, from the States. Bobby was from Yonkers. Siomas was from Chicago, but lived in New York up on the Upper West Side. And then me and Peter, I remember, I'll never forget it. He goes, I've always wanted a funky band. You know, 
<laughs> the British, the British guys, you know, it's just a different kind of funk that they play. Yeah. Yep. It, it, it is, it is, it's a different, yeah. And you know, you, you could argue that like, there's a whole other great kind of feel that, that British musicians bring. Uh, but like you say, if you want that sort of like American funk, you've got to, you know, you get those guys, like you say, a, a guy that's from Chicago and a guy from New York and. Well, and yeah. also Bobby, you know, I know Bob, I came from that fusion school and I'd been listening to the funkiest stuff by Herbie, you know, the headhunter stuff. And that's oh, yeah. still what I, I love the most you yeah. know, to this day is, is that funky feel. And uh, Bobby was completely so into Herbie and you'll hear it, you can hear it on his solo on Do You Feel? I mean, he, I've heard keyboard players try to break down that solo. It's not an easy solo to play. No, and Bobby's no. just, he didn't plan that out. We were just jamming. So I think Bobby and I connected more on that fusion level than than Peter or John and I did. You know, those guys were kind of coming at it with the structure in place. And I think Bobby and I just went with whatever we felt might work in a in an improvisational kind of way. Yeah, yeah. That's that was a question I was gonna ask you is if you if you guys mixed it up night to night, was it I mean the form obviously has to be pretty much the same but did you it probably you probably didn't all play it the same every time it was you played different it. every night peter gave us yeah. a lot of latitude but i think you know our band gained respect because we always stayed pretty close to to the skeleton structure that you know needed to be there to, yeah. to make it the song but then we had plenty of room to to throw in different fills yeah and and did you, do you remember, um, Stanley? If if you record was it was that was the version that we hear? I know that version's from November twenty second, nineteen seventy five, from SUNY Plattsburgh. I I got the right, dates on the studio that. version. Uh, the live your live version. Oh, where's it from? That's from from SUNY Plattsburgh in Berg, November twenty second, nineteen seventy five. Because ninety percent of of what would become comes alive. Uh, I think Plattsburgh is in New York, isn't it? Um, this says... Check it, because I think it was in New York. Yeah, it says... It's, yeah, I'll, I'll check that. I'll, I'll check that. I think it might be Plattsburgh, which is a place in Long Island. I'm not sure. I could well, be mistaken. No, no. So you're, so you're right. So there's three different... There's three different... Um, this is what it's... It claim, what they're claiming is that most of the stuff, I think, comes from Winterland Ballroom. I would say seventy five percent or eighty. Yeah, and I th I always thought the entire record was from San Francisco because of Hello San Francisco, um, right? But Long Island Arena and that, according to what our friends at Wikipedia say, that one song, do you feel, comes from uh, SUNY Plattsburgh, Platt yeah, oh, Plattsburgh, I think you're right. New York, Plattsburgh, yeah, New what, York. Um, I was I was thinking that do you feel was from Winterland because I always thought we got so much of it from winterland that i just sometimes forget which where the the odd ones were, were plucked from yeah and that, so that was my question is did you you probably recorded all these different shows and then you i'm guessing picked that version maybe from from new york as though from plattsburgh as being the one maybe the best or when we came out to the wally hyder truck that Peter had hired in at Winterland that night and heard our show from the get-go. The first song, Something's Happening. We just started listening from the beginning. And we we were almost like getting the champagne out. It sounded so good to us. You know, we knew we had something. Yeah. When we heard something's happening, the first song, that's what kicked off the show. Yeah. Great. Song. And it was it just jumped out of the speakers. And Peter had engineered it along with the Wally Hyder people and Peter's a damn good engineer so he knew how to get the sounds for a live recording because he'd done it with Humble Pie yeah, and Rockin' okay. Fillmore so I remember you know Bobby making a point about how the fretless bass had this unique kind of growl that gave it a really different sound now I'm, I'm not here to say that that fretless bass was the the sine qua non of do you uh, of, of comes alive, but it I play fretless throughout the entire set, 
but you, most bass players are shocked when they find that out because I didn't do all the sliding yeah. that a lot of fretless bass. I just, I played the note, I played it in tune and I played the funkiest kind of stuff that I, I imagine James Jamerson would play. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Danko, and Danko too was funky yeah. like that. So well, I was just trying to do my best to play it in tune. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to play some of it. And uh, it's, it's, your bass playing is so amazing. And, and I'll just tell you that as a drummer, going back to when I first really started listening to this song in 1976, my sister gave me the album. I looked for it after we did our sound check. I have it somewhere that I was excited to hold up the double, you know, the, the vinyl album. But anyway, um, I remember listening to this song and listening of, as, as a drummer, of course, listening to John Sayomos, but listening to you as much and realizing even as a kid how you held it all together. Like those, those quarter notes, those notes that you're playing during the breakdown, during the instrumental, um, that's, that's the glue. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play the song right now. And, and I think everybody that listens to this is going to hear the same thing. So here's the more up-tempo version. Little uh, two bar phrase there. Yeah. Well, I woke up this morning with a wine glass in my hand. Who's wine? What wine? Where the hell did I die? Must have been a dream. I don't believe where I'm in. Come on, let's do it again. You, you, you. I hear the James Jameson. Yeah. Are you gonna play the whole thing now? No, I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. In fact. take a little pause right there for a second um yeah you know it, it's uh yeah it, it i didn't really think of james jamerson until you said that and now that's all i can hear no and no and that's no not to say that you're copying him it's a great homage to, to his I, I love his playing as well you know as a big motown fan myself over the years i still you know like today i was practicing old jamerson songs it's he had this this style with a with one finger I've kind of, you know, I'm getting it. I've still, you know, I'm seeing progress. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's, Jamerson is not easy to imitate, but I've done my best over the years to do it. And I, like I say, I'm, I'm seeing progress. Wow. Stanley, you're a phenomenal bass player, man. I, I've been a huge fan for... Oh, thanks. Yeah, for 40 almost 50 years now you know since i became aware of you and and you know now as we're talking about this and and really as i listen to this right here and now in real time i feel like the big difference in that song is you because john is definitely playing more restrained it's interesting and, and that's what i was getting at earlier is the the contrast typically when a band plays a song live the drummer tends to play a little bit busier, plays a few more fills, besides it being a little more up-tempo. There's just like a, it's like license to, to play a little bit more, get a little busier. And John, it's like, he's, he's brought it down a notch from, from what I can hear from the studio version. And mm -hmm. he's just totally locked into you. You guys are just fucking like, 
so in the zone. Well, he and I, you know, we 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 made a pretty damn good rhythm section, you know, from day yeah. one. We just clicked. It's just yeah. one of those things because it's like we were talking earlier. You know, we were listening to a lot of Motown stuff. John loved that stuff too, and he just he was he was a my dream drummer. I mean, I I played with a lot of great ones, and I like them all, love them all. I've been lucky to play with so many great drummers, but John is 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 unique in the fact that. Uh, he got replaced in the Frampton band by so many of these great drummers. <laughs> and Peter just wanted him to, to and, and Peter still tells, you know, Dan, his drummer now, the same thing. Man, man, that sounds just like John. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Dan Wojciechowski. Got to give a shout out. I know Dan. Great Dan's drummer. really, he, he's the greatest. Yeah. A great guy. Phenomenal drummer. Um, yeah. And I've heard that from Dan. I've heard that from um, a, a friend of mine, Brian Fullen, played with him in the 90s, played with Peter for a bit. And I remember him telling me, he was a Zildjian guy, Brian. I signed him up to Zildjian. And I remember him saying to me, um, can, you, can you find me a ride cymbal that sounds like John Sy Peter was, is, really wants that ride sound. And he wanted, and you probably, I'm sure, can attest to this. He wanted all his drummers to have that. And I, I have such respect for Peter for being that zoned into a cymbal as a guitar player. Right. right? <laughs> to go, I want that, I want you to have that ride cymbal sound that, and, and it's, it wasn't an easy thing to replicate, you know, because that was a pretty magical sound. And whatever it was, do you think it was a Zildjian? I think it was a Zildjian 22A ride. I think so. And his ride symbol, John had this this style where he could just nail it with his bass drum, you know, at the uh, same time. It's just yeah. killer feel. Ridiculous. I know. Almost, almost different... like a boogaloo, you know? Yeah. It was a, yep. a boogaloo style which I love. And he, he played those syncopated patterns with the, like you say, this foot and the ride. And then he, I'm left-handed, so it's the opposite, but then he'd, he'd do these things on the hi-hats. So he'd go, he'd be playing like, digga, digga, ding, kss, kss, you know, and like, I hadn't heard people play like that at that point in my life. That was so different and new and opened my mind to this other world of, of just being that independent, you know? You know, if it, it, it's kind of sad, you know, John left us so soon, but when we left New York to go out on the tour that summer, I didn't even go home. I passed the audition and we said, okay, we're going to the first gig. You know, the audition was in May and our first gig was June 1st or something. So I didn't even go home. We just hit the road. But uh, I remember, I think John must have been one of the, I, I've heard Ricky Murata tell me this. John was probably the most one of the most sought after drummers in the session world because of that uh, Todd Rundgren stuff he had just done yeah, uh, on something, anything. And he was, he was considered, you know, in that elite group of, of the greatest session guys. And when he left to go on the road, that left a vacuum that was going to be filled right? because it always is. Yep. But uh, yeah, I've heard Rick say that because he knew John. Yeah. Rick, and then, you know, Rick was one of the most sought after session drummers in, in the whole world. So, yeah, he knew. Yeah, we, we talked, Rick and I often talk about John and because, uh, you know, I, I never had the honor of meeting him. And he was one of these guys that uh, I wished I could have tracked down. I remember um, talking to Bobby Mayo one of, before Bobby left us. Yeah, you I, met Bobby? I, I did. I met him twice. I'll tell you, the first time I met him, he was playing with Holland Oates about right. 30 years, like in the early 90s. Yeah. And uh, the drummer at that time it came in after Mickey Curry. The drummer's name was Michael Braun. I don't know if you know Mike, but... He, he I know was, the name. Yeah, he was with them for a while, and he introduced me at a gig to Bobby Mayo. Bobby. And, uh, and they were all kidding him. Everybody in the band, I think even Daryl and John would say, Bob Mayo on the keyboards, Bob Mayo. Bob Mayo. Bob Mayo. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and, Bob, and you know Bob, I, 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 I didn't know him, obviously, just other than meeting him. And he'd be kind of like, yeah, okay, enough, enough <laughs> of that shit. You know what I mean? Like, Bob Mayo on the keyboards. And then about, I don't know how many years later, this I'm thinking it was about 20 years ago, uh, my buddy Jack Bruno was playing drums with Peter Frampton one summer. And Jack invited me to the show locally here at Great Woods. And I came out and Jack and Bobby Mayo and I sat together in catering and had dinner and we talked and I, I really picked his brain about John. And at that time he said, John was a, a paramedic in New York. He said he's a, or a firefighter or, or a paramedic or something. 
That's right. And uh, and I said, man, I, I I'd love to get a hold of him and and just tell him how much he means to me. And if he like, you know, in my little mind, I'm thinking like maybe I could send him a few symbols if he's still playing. And I think he said he wasn't really playing anymore. Um, so and then yeah. I think not long after he was gone. And then Bobby, not long after that. They died within two months of each other. It was unca uncanny. And that's really what brought Peter and I back together. You know, because wow. Peter and I had lost touch over the years. And uh, when those two died, I remember get, getting on the phone. And Peter and I are both going, what the frick is going on here? Okay, let's we better get together while we can. And the, it, was, it was right about that time after they both had passed away, Bobby... Or John first, and then I can't remember who was first. I think John. I think John was first. I, I maybe I, in, in January, and then Bobby in March or something. Wow. And so they yeah. were gone, and Peter and I started talking in, in earnest again about maybe playing together. And that's when he invited me to come back in and help. Write, you know, he he let me write a song with him for the, his Grammy winner, uh, uh, Fingerprints. Yes. Right. Right. So that was 2004 or five, right after John and Bobby died. And we got together and did that. And then a couple of years later, we did the 35th anniversary tour for Frampton Comes Alive. Yeah. And that ran from, that was a six year run that I did with him from 2010 through 17. And uh, so pretty recent actually. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. That And that's, that's a great story, uh, you know, that, in spite of the sadness of losing John and Bobby that you, you guys reunited and you were able to more or less, I mean, Peter just kind of really retired last year or the year before, I think. Yeah, but he's doing the never say never tour. <laughs> of course <laughs> he is. <laughs> he's going to go out this summer, I think. And that's the name of the tour, the never say never. <laughs> it's a good name for a tour. That's a great after, you've, after you've retired. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I'm happy he's playing still me too yeah he loves it that's great well it must have been great to to kind of put those old comfortable shoes back on and get back out and play with him you know and and uh it was really nice years. it was great you know and six years went by like that but wow. uh yeah i don't know he's got he's got a really good band now bass player's great i'm sure they'll sound wonderful yeah yeah my one of my bandmates just texted me. He, I think he joined this uh, in progress and and didn't hear you talking about the fretless bass. So he texted me, Paul Gianelli, and said, "Ask him, ask him if he played a fretless bass." And I said, <laughs> "He is." <laughs> so, yeah. But we we do, my band does. Do you feel like we do? And um, and the guy that just texted me, it's we're a three piece band, and the two guitar players switch off on guitar and bass. And this particular that's got to be hard to do with three because of that harmony intro. Yeah, yeah, it's it's we 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 bluff it. We uh yeah, it's we we don't sing just the, like... sing a part over it. <laughs> I should try that. Yeah, but he's got the talk box down. He really nails the talk. Oh, box he does part, and he plays all the solos just like Peter, and and he sings it too. So he he does nice. a great job with it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'm doing a little uh, project now with Joe Vitale. And some other veterans. I don't know. Is it okay if I talk about that? Yeah, please. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. And we're playing the hits of our boss, ex-bosses. You know, uh, Joey's bringing more to the marquee than anybody. Joe Vitale, you know, Rocky Mountain Way, Crosby, Stills, Nash, uh, uh, Eagles. We're doing some Frampton. We found a British singer that can cover all this stuff. And he was with... Uh, Kenny Jones from the faces. So we can do some of, you know, like stay with me. We're doing some oh, really man. good. We have a, a 25 set song set list of hits. That's it's pretty impressive. And uh, we just haven't thought of the right name yet. You know, it's, <laughs> it's kind of hard to market this thing. Yeah. Cause we yeah. all know what we've done on these records, but nobody else does, but that's the, that's our criteria. Okay. We either have to have a, uh, uh, been on the record or, or done the live tour so we're doing werewolves of london because i did you know warren zevon's excitable boy tour for two years yeah so we're including that and i think waddy's okay with that he does 
you know, there's so many bands doing this format, playing the hits of, of like, you know, Im immediate families doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we're trying to do with, with this uh, thing with Vitaly and some other guys and me. What it's a great! I, now that you say that, Stanley, I think I saw something. I think one of you, you or Joe, put something up a while ago. I think, on on Facebook, maybe talking about this or. Well, we've been we've been put, putting it out there in certain arenas, so not everybody has seen it yet. Uh, but Joe Vitale Jr., he's like our 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 secret weapon because he's multi instrumentalist and he he nails the talk box on Rocky Mountain Way. Wow. And if we wanted to do, do, do you feel he could do that too, but he plays great conga drums. Obviously he's a great drummer, Joe Jr. too. Yeah. But he's course. really good on guitar. He's our utility guy. Great, man. Well, I hope you come through my, my neck of the woods sometime. I would love to see this band. Are you still in Massachusetts? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just South of Boston. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I'll get you my, I think I sent it to you, but I'll, I'll I've got you your number it. now. Yeah. yeah yeah good good well let's 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 listen to a little bit more of the tune and uh i think there's even still a few more things i want to throw you yeah, away once, your we, list. once we start listening to it um yeah and and sorry for my mess up on mis <laughs> confusing plattsburgh with pittsburgh um, no that's an easy mistake shoot <laughs> Oh, the other thing I was going to, and this, this is, a, I know it's a known, it's not a, a secret, but it's interesting to look at what a and how a and chose to, to package the record by putting, do you feel like we do as the last song on the, on the live album, but it was actually a few songs before the end in the actual live set, right? It was not the last song. No, it night. was, it was the last song. It was. Okay. Well, excluding the encore, maybe. I see. We would, okay. We always had an encore song. Yeah. Which yeah. might have been, I don't know, what did we do for Encore? I forget, Plain Shame or White Sugar, or some of his other ones, you know, in case. And we started getting Encores later. You know. Yeah. Or maybe Jumpin' Jack Flash, was that an It might have been Jumpin' Jack, could have been an Encore. Yeah. 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 Okay. But Do You Feel was always the last song in the set. It certainly makes sense. I mean, it's, I don't, I don't know how you, how anybody follows that song, you know, when you, <laughs> when you, the big ending the big yeah. ending the it's big it's ending. kind of turned into a real rock anthem absolutely man the big ending i made a note about the big ending and somewhere in my scribbles i'll get to that when we get to the big ending but um well that's really where i let the james jamerson licks fly you yeah know? <laughs> it's, it's it's like a minute well it's pri i guess it's the big ending is is the is that big drawn out thing but that last minute and a half when you guys go from um coming out of the instrumental out of the talk box section and you do about a minute and a half of building to that big ending right and what you guys play there is some of the most incredible like fusiony you know incredible music i mean you, everybody really stands out in that spot as you you can hear i mean we're all it, it's it took so much patience just to get to that part of the song you know that <laughs> the long like seven minutes of um, Dun, dun. I had to be really patient to play that, you know. Yeah. So I was just couldn't wait to get to the ending and play a little more. Well, <clears throat> you played it like a pro because you know, I mean it's those those notes, those those notes that you're hitting, they're like to me, they're like place markers for John. You know, he's playing that little 16th note thing in the hi-hat and the cross stick and it's without without your solid like i guess the the to me the difference between the studio version and the live version is like your beat is so definite it's so like there's no mistaking where it's going to be you just land on it we made it a groove you know and john was he did some amazing stuff on the hi-hat through that but he you know he that was really his section because I was just kind of just making sure, you know, one was where it exactly needed to be. And every yeah. now and then I'd throw in a little fill. Yeah. But yeah. only like every four bars or eight bars even, I would wait and just play those notes. And it worked. Yeah. This is the uh, this is the classic moment right here. Let's see. Bob gets his intro here. 
The great Bob Mayer. You know, if you listen to his whole solo, we missed it. But it's great. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll back it up a little bit. Funky man, yeah. That's Herbie. Yeah. What's well, Bobby? Yeah. On a Fender Rose, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Amazing solo. Yeah. Beautiful. And then, speaking of you, let's I'm gonna move up here a little bit. There's a little thing you do on the right there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I love that. I always love that. That's. I think it's just one time that you do it. I just do it once. Yeah. Did I do it again? No, I just rewound it. <laughs> you know, that's what the guys in those bands like Billy Preston and Billy Preston and uh, Earth, Wind and Fire, kind of a little two note chord on the bass. Cool. Yeah. But this is what I mean right here, Stanley. You know, it's, it's, we've all heard this song a million times, but those simple little place markers right there, man. That's like... As a drummer... You gotta have a bass player with incredible time like you. Who no, knows where the beat is, you know? It's, yeah, that was... That was a groove. That's a groove. You know, Peter, too, is playing his ass off. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, man. Yeah. It's all four of us. You know, that's the thing. It's, it's almost like any great band, I think. The chemistry of the four yeah. people. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's... All right, so... The big ending... The beginning, yeah. I'm going to take it to... So as it builds right here. The big slide. Yeah. My favorite section of the song right here. So funky, and then he moves to the ride on this part. That's 16th note, man. That's awesome. Yeah.
takes me right back i'll bet man you know i i just gotta say just incredible just incredible thank you you know it's i was i was talking while it was playing but i think you heard me it's it's that unique chemistry of of every and every member yeah if yeah if one of those parts is is different it's going to sound different absolutely and 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 i i I told I completely agree, and I'm glad you mentioned that because it's the sum of all the parts. I know that. I know it's it's you know, and I I have to think anybody in the band would say the same thing. Peter, yourself, John, Bobby, you know that it was it was a very special collaboration you guys had that made that whole record so amazing. Yeah, sometimes you just I don't know. You thank your lucky stars that. Uh, serendipity like that happens between people you know and it just comes together with the right people yeah before i let you go stanley i mean we sort of talked a little bit about this off camera but uh off the air did you have any inclination that this record would go on to be what it became and then now almost 50 years later still be like a a staple and classic rock it's still it's just one of those things you know people we had no idea it was going to be that. When I was telling you the story about being at Electric Lady with the, the tapes from the show that we were listening to for the first time and trying to see what we had. Uh, yeah, we knew it was good, but there's no way we could have known what it was going to become. Yeah, it was it was I think people still are mystified as to what exactly made Peter Frampton at that point in time become the biggest act on earth. Yeah. And there, there's a lot of ingredients, you know. Uh, I don't know. You well, tell I, me. I, I think I think what you just said, though, the 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 fact that, um, you know, all you guys together, it was it was it was the, you know, and taking nothing away from how great the songs are, because they're great songs. But the interesting thing is the most all I think all the songs had already been recorded and released as studio versions on other you know his three prior records so it's interesting that this live album with these two new players in the band just there was like a new kind of energy new kind of sound a new kind of something that just really brought it all together and made it like you said i mean this was the biggest record for and peter was the biggest band for like a solid two or three years this record was on the charts like it was a good two years of, of complete craziness yeah yeah all over the world it was a really fun time we got to go australia and japan for the first time new zealand and it was a worldwide phenomenon yeah i don't know uh kind of like abba we're cute we were cute too <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely you were cute that had a lot to do with it that was so definitely all the a lot. ingredients everything was everything was in place and then also the management was very shrewd to use can't use a word yeah shrewd yeah. and they marketed it just you know as as you would expect a pop band to be marketed to, to the max yeah right yeah okay but I, I want to thank you before we go and just say thank you for doing this today and, uh, you know, sharing this information. I think this has been phenomenal and it's it's been something I've wanted to talk to you about for a long time. So thank you so much for being here today. Oh, John, thank you. I've really enjoyed this. I was a little nervous because I was thinking, how can I talk about that song for a whole hour? But <laughs> there's There was a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. And the well, good thank news you, is man. Yeah, well, my pleasure. The good news is by playing the song, almost the complete, that complete song and the studio version, we ate up almost a half hour. So I, I let you off the hook a little bit. It's crazy that, you know, they played that on the radio, the whole thing. Back in the summer of summer 76, I, I don't think there had ever been a song that long before on the radio. 
It's crazy. I, absolutely. And probably not since either. Yeah. That may All be right. a good thing. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, <laughs> a big hand for Stanley Sheldon. Thank you for tuning in today. Stanley, thank you so much. And Thank uh, you, man. Hang with me for one second, if you would, and uh, we'll say goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Well, that's the show. Thank you for watching Track Talk with Stanley Sheldon. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, and I'll see you again real soon. Thanks again.